morning. My name is Allison and I help curate experiences, kudos that are open to anyone and everyone. Um, and the intention of this web series is to continue Kudos' critical mission to connect you with the passions of the folks that are around you, to spark understanding and celebrate neurodiversity. Today, we share the afternoon with a new guest named Larissa. See if you can spot her in your gallery. Um, but she's better known as a sand artist behind Pure Doodles, which are large scale sand art that have been gracing the White Rock Pier since 2017. Well, thank you, Allison, very much for the warm welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. I'm really excited to share one of my favorite hobbies with you today, and that's sand art, or drawing on the beach. So as Allison mentioned, my name is Larissa. But here in White Rock, where I live, most people know me more by the sand art that I create. And I thought, the plan for today, um, for our experience together, is that I'll start by telling you a little bit about how I got started with sand art and all the, the highlights along the way. I've brought some of my tools with me that I'd love to show you how, what I use to create sand art. And then I have some video clips to share that will show you some different ideas and tools and techniques that you can use the next time you're at the beach or the next time you want to create some public artwork um, in your communities. So that is the plan. Um, throughout the presentation, like Allison mentioned, I will be pausing for questions along the way, but we will have a Q&A session at the very end. So if you don't ask a question along the way, that's okay. We'll have time at the end to talk a little bit more. So I'm going to get started by sharing some photos of artwork that I've created in the past. So just give me a sec here to get it set up. Um, here we go. Yes, All right. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So this is a very typical design that I create at White Rock at low tide when the water, you know, is far back and there's lots of sand available to draw on. I will go to the beach, I bring a rake with me, and I draw in the sand. I usually spend about an hour to two hours creating a design, and I love drawing all sorts of different things. So here this is more of a mandala um, design, but I also really enjoy drawing animals. This is a frog that I drew from a couple weeks ago, and you can see in the corner there, um, for scale, there's a little artist and a big giant sand design frog. Um, this is an image of some whales that I did at a workshop last summer. So this was a group of people coming together to create this lovely sand art. And I also really draw, love drawing natural elements like flowers and plants. And of course, I'm really drawn to mandala designs. I really like the geometry and the symmetry that they have. And I think they look really striking when you're walking along and suddenly you happen upon this mandala drawn in the sand. Um, but no matter what I draw, it always has the same fate. When it comes to sand art, eventually the water does come in, the tide rises, and it washes the design away. And that is just a natural part of the process. And at first, it can seem kind of scary because, you know, you spend time and you spend effort creating something beautiful only for it to get erased. But actually the, the impermanence or the fact that the artwork is temporary makes it more special because it means that anyone that happens to walk by and see the artwork that you've created, it's because they've come by at that exact right moment. If they came by earlier, it wouldn't be drawn. If they came, came up a little too late, then the water would have already washed it away. But when they come at that exact right moment, it makes it special and it creates that connection with you and your community in making artwork this way. This is a little photo of the first sand art I ever did. <laughs> this was in the spring of 2017. And um, it's a lot smaller than what I tend to draw now. Um, but I had seen examples of sand art in the past, both locally and online. There are a lot of sand artists in places like California and Australia, where they have a lot of beaches to work with. Um, and I thought it looked like fun. And I really love drawing. And I thought it might be something that I could try here in White Rock. And so 
I um, headed out and, and gave it a shot. And what was amazing is that right from the first design, people were really happy about it. They said, thank you for drawing it. They said it looked cool. And I could see that in using these very simple methods, um, I was spreading joy in my community. Originally though, and, and I like sharing this story, I was really nervous about drawing in public because you know people are, are watching and I sort of, I wanted to draw a design but still be this secret artist so that, okay, it's fine if people see the artwork, but I'll just kind of be, you know, in the background. Um, but that plan backfired because after doing my first design, a couple of days later, there was an image <laughs> of me drawing in the paper. So someone had taken a picture while I was working on my design and submitted it. And that made me realize that if I wanted to keep on exploring this type of artwork, I would have to learn to be more open and more giving with my art. And that's been a very important lesson um, that I've learned and, and continue to practice along the way. So since then, I've had a lot of practice with it. This image is from a couple years ago at a sea festival in White Rock and um, before social distancing measures were a thing. Uh, and you can see that um, here I am working on a commission. So as I kept on practicing art, suddenly I was being invited to create sand art for specific events in the community and various festivals. So here there's people enjoying the artwork being drawn. Another amazing thing that happened over the summers was I was invited to create a marriage proposal for a couple, which is something I never imagined sand art would ever lead me to. And I think it just shows you that if you, if you follow a hobby um, or, or seek out and be curious about the things that you enjoy doing, you, you never know where they're going to take you. Uh, last summer, there was a sort of new evolution or a new chapter in my relationship with sand art, and that was introducing group workshops. So rather than creating the artwork myself, uh, it was an entirely new skill set to figure out how do I teach this and continue to share this with others. This is a shot from a workshop um, from a warm up and these exercises will, I will be sharing with you later on in our, in our experience today. So I'm looking very forward to that. The thing that was amazing about the workshops was that it showed me that by sharing the same principle, you could end up with all these wildly different and unique and beautiful results. So these five artworks that you see in a row here, these were all done by workshop participants and it had been their first time doing sand art. And it was amazing to see them get the concept and apply it and create these beautiful things on their first try. So it was a very enriching experience that way. But no matter how this project changes over time, at the end of the day, what brings me back is being able to surprise and delight my community. I think it's really magical when people discover this artwork that they weren't expecting. And um, I, I just find it magical in its own way. I also really love seeing kids and adults too, who come across a design that I've done and then give it a shot themselves. Because I think there's something important to recognize that you don't have to do anything complicated in order for it to make a big impact. You can use really simple tools and really simple methods. And just by the nature of showing up and creating artwork, you can create ripples in your community that you had no idea that, you're, that you were able to. And that sort of brings us to now, this is the first artwork that I did this season after um, the pier was opened up after lockdown. It's a happy little son wearing a face mask. And, um, you know, again, this summer presents its own unique challenges and its own um, unique evolutions of sand art. I never imagined that I would be here with you guys today and doing a demo about sand art from, you know, in front of my computer and in my kitchen. But here we are, it continues to evolve and change and, and, um, and develop over time. Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on to talking about tools and techniques? I see a question uh, from Raymond um, in the chat. He says, nice, perfect sand artwork. How long did it take you? It depends on the design. Um, most of the designs are about an hour to two hours long. 
And I see Vanessa, um, she has a hand. What got you into it? What got me into it? Um, really, it was on that first day, just I thought it looked fun. I had no idea that it would turn into this big thing. It just, it looked fun and I like to draw and I like to be outside. So I gave it a try. And I know um, in that photo that you shared with other beach lovers and beach goers that are making their mark in the sand. Yes. Um, I saw somebody with hearts uh, wrote father in Chinese. Yes, that um, was so from around Father's Day. How amazing. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, I was going to ask, um, in your workshops, um, do you normally do collaborative pieces with um, people you workshop with, or have you had experience working with somebody else? Yeah, so I've done a little bit of both. That picture that I showed with all the mandalas in a row, everyone did their own. Um, but in the picture with the whales, that was multiple people working together on the same, same design. So it's a little bit of both. All right. Are we good for questions? Am I good to move on to, to talking about tools? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. So um, in terms of tools, um, the first one, this one might seem really weird, but I do think it's an important tool in its own way. It's sketchbooks. Do any of you guys have some sketchbooks at home or like to draw? I know I do. I do. So, oh, awesome. So um, yeah, I keep sketchbooks for all sorts of things, but I do have a couple that I keep just for my Peer Doodles designs. And um, about half of my designs I will plan out ahead of time. And the other half, I will just show up at the beach and not have an idea and just see what happens that day. And I think as an artist and, and as creatives, it's, it's good to experiment with both of those things. So I'll just show you a page here. Um, let's see, sometimes, so here's that wedding proposal design. Sometimes I'll take the time and actually really draw everything out and how I want it to look like. Um, and with this design, since I wanted it to be absolutely perfect, I also worked out some of the, um, you can see there's some of the um, sizes and dimensions so that I knew it would be a large enough size. And you can kind of see I'm also working out how can I use circles as a little guideline to make sure that the design stays nice and symmetrical and even. So sometimes for some designs, I'll spend a lot of time sketching it and working it out. But other times that's not the case. So, so I'll show you another page. This one's a little messier and you see there isn't a complete idea, but it's all these little bits and pieces of things that I find interesting. So this isn't a complete design, but maybe I'll use this pattern in a border someday. Or, you know, here's a little mandala design with a maple leaf in it. Or here's, um, you know, a little starburst. And maybe these aren't fully formed ideas, but, you know, later on I can return to it and draw some inspiration from it. So I think when it comes to keeping a sketchbook, the, the tendency is sometimes to make all the designs very perfect and very beautiful. And certainly you can do that, but ultimately it's a good idea to, um, to really use your sketchbook to work through ideas. And it's okay if that looks a little messier or a little more scattered sometimes. So first tool um, that I use is the sketchbook. Now let's move on to rakes. So this is the first, um, the first rake that I ever <laughs> used. And it came with a little gardening set. It's just what I happen to have already but I thought that this might work pretty well as a miniature rake. And um, I still use it today. The plus side to this is that it's very small and it's very portable. So it's something that you could put in your backpack or put in your tote bag and bring with you to the beach very easily. You don't wanna be lugging around a bunch of equipment. Um, the downside to the hand rake is that you can't really make any design that's too big because it will either take a very long time or just like your arm will get so sore trying to, <laughs> to trying to fill in a really giant design. Um, but I still bring this with me as a backup and I, I like using it to put some details in the design. So even though I tend to use a, a larger rake, 
for most of the design, I'll still bring this along to do some of the details and it works really well. And you know, this kind of tool is widely available either at a hardware store, even sometimes the dollar store will have these little gardening tools. So that's something that you can use if you want to use um, an actual tool. Um, so moving on to rakes, this is the, this, okay, this doesn't look so pretty close up, but it gets the job done. Um, this is the rake that I typically use. It is a, a homemade version. So this is another one of those gardening tools that I've attached to um, like a broom handle. And um, I think I use zip ties to attach it. And then I strengthened that with some good old duct tape. Um, and I really like using this tool because it's nice and light. Um, it's large enough that I can fill in large areas quickly, but it's also small enough that um, I can do line art and, and put in some of the details that I really do enjoy drawing, especially when it comes to those mandala designs and the geometric designs. Um, so this is what I use the most often. It's the first long rake that I built and the one that I continue to use today. So that's what I use there. Um, now this is a little more typical of what people expect when you're talking about a rake. And this kind of tool works excellently as well for sand art. However, because it's really wide, um, you're not going to be able to get the same amount of detail. It's still great if you're working in a really large scale or if you're doing something more abstract like wiggly lines or spirals and things like that. Um, but again, the not so great for detail, but still a very handy tool. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, another tool, and this one might seem a little bit weird, um, but it's string. <laughs> and this string is kind of like my ruler or my circle maker when I'm making a really large design. So what I will do is I'll take a, a stick or a peg and put that in the sand and then loop the string around it. And then with this part, with the spool, I'll um, hold it with my rake and walk around the center. And that helps me trace a really large circle so that I can use that as a guideline when I'm creating my sand art. And these little blue bits on here, I don't know if you can see, these are just little pieces of tape that I've marked off um, some different measurements. So if I need to measure something out, this is sort of my homemade ruler that I can use while I'm out there. So that is really helpful for larger designs. Okay, so those are, those are the tools that I brought. Um, I do wanna share a very quick video clip. Um, this is a time-lapse photography that uh, Bill Kellett filmed and very generously shared with me. And uh, so let me get that set up, but it'll show you how I use my tools. And um, because it's a time-lapse, this is basically, you know, what I do in, in a course of two hours, but it's shrunk down so that it's just uh, 45 seconds long or so. So let me share that with you guys. There we go. So you can see um, there I am using the string and I'm creating the guidelines before doing the design. And then I use my hand rake to make a little detailed middle and then switching to the long rake to fill in the design. And you can see with the mandalas, it's really just a matter of going layer by layer and adding one detail at a time all around the border of the circle. So whether that is a petal shape or a spiral or an outline, one detail at a time, just repeated around the circle, eventually connects and creates something that looks really intricate and interesting and beautiful. I wish I, wish I could work this quickly. Unfortunately, this is the sped up version. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that really shows you start to finish how I go about creating the design. Do you have any preferences for which of the tools you're using, say, during um, a raining time, or are there particular times that you find uh, yourself gravitating towards the beach more often? Yeah, so um, it's tricky with rain. Um, I don't mind getting wet and I don't mind drawing in the rain, but what will happen is if the sand gets too wet, it starts behaving like mud. 
And so what will happen is if you draw a line in it, it the line gets swallowed up by the sand and sort of disappears. So if it's overcast weather or a little bit drizzly, sometimes I can get away with doing sand art in those conditions. But if it's too wet and the sand gets too saturated, then it doesn't, the design doesn't stick. It's even less impermanent than it's supposed to be. <laughs> Almost like a, a, an Etch-a-Sketch or a dry erase or something, it just melts away. I have a question from Raymond asking, um, he wonders if the rain or the ocean waves destroy the sand. Maybe we're thinking about how long does it live for? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the waves do eventually come in and wash it away. And um, the tide cycle is always different depending on the day. Generally, the designs last for a few hours. Um, but it's really interesting, like the, the tide syncs up with the moon cycle, which is really crazy to think about, but the, the moon's gravitational pull affects the waves and affects the tides. So some days it'll be low tide for a very long time, like almost all day, and other times it'll be low tide only for a matter of a couple hours. Um, and also low tide, um, the level can vary every day. So low tide on a Monday, <laughs> on a given day, might still be too high for me to have space to draw. Whereas then, you know, a, a few weeks later, it'll be so low that there's plenty of space. So it really depends on that schedule. It's almost like checking the weather, but checking the tide cycle instead. And I see Deanna's holding, holding on to a cue. Um, are we good now for yeah. one more? Awesome. For sure. Sorry, Louisa. Um, how long have you been a sand artist for? Um, this is my fourth summer doing it. So I don't do it year round. I do it in the summer months, but it's been um, three years. This is my fourth, yeah, fourth summer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Alrighty. Are there any other questions about the tools before we move on to the techniques and the demo that I want to share? I had Brody who wanted to know if any of your beautiful um, designs translate on canvas. Or interesting. Um, that's a very interesting question. I'm sure they would. Um, I enjoy drawing them in my sketchbook, but I haven't ever drawn them um, on canvas or in other art forms. But certainly that's a, that's a really wonderful idea. And I think Vanessa also was hanging on to a question. Do you do your artwork at any other um, beaches or those at your location? That's also a good question. So far, I have only done it in White Rock. Okay, I feel like so you don't go to Port Moody or anything? Nope. No, I haven't yet. Um, no. That would be fun to do, but uh, at the same time, I, I really see it as like a, a sort of neighborhood project or community project, so I really like um, creating it here for, for people in my neighborhood. Okay. Because you're very talented. Thank you. Thank you very much. The other thing that, that I really like about the pier in particular is that it's a, a really nice spot for people to watch because they're above the design so they can see it really well from up top. Whereas sometimes if you're just walking beside it, it doesn't, it doesn't look quite the same that it does once you're elevated and able to look down on it from above. So the pier is really nice as like a, a, a viewing point for sand art. I know earlier Vicky was also sharing a beautiful spider she drew in her sketchbook as well. Oh, and I would love to see it. A question. Hold on. I'm just going to unmute you so we can hear. Oh, it. I see. I see the spider. Oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. <gasps> that's so pretty. Oh, Vicky, that's amazing. Yeah, pretty much I love to draw. So you and me kind of have a good inspiration. So I was wondering, do I plan to go for the competition, for the sign, sign off competition? Oh, for a standard competition. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah. not sure, I'm not sure that there is one. Um, 
I don't know of any. I know that there are other sand artists that practice around the world. I'm not aware that there's any competition. And actually, I don't know that I would enter one just because I like doing this as a hobby and for fun. Um, and I think that's, that's um, at least for me, more important is just to focus on, on enjoying drawing, the love of drawing and the love of creating sand art. All right, so, um, so let's move on now. So now that I've talked a little bit about tools, I wanted to share some techniques that are really good for beginners if you're just um, you know, starting out with sand art. So I'll show some video clips. I actually, I went out and filmed these on the weekend <laughs> for you guys because I wanted to have a little bit of a, of a demo element to, to this. So let me share my screen and get that started, get that set up. All right, can everyone see? It should say sand art for beginners. We're good, okay. So. All right, so I know I just got done talking about tools, but the wonderful thing about sand art is that you can use what you have. You can work with what you have. You don't need any special equipment. Um, here's a shot of me using the rake that I just showed you um, moments ago. And as you can see, that creates a certain effect. But by using what you have or what you have around you, you can recreate all sorts of different effects when you're doing sand art. So here's a shot of using the hand rake. As you can see, it creates a thinner line than the, the larger rake and is good for details. But even if you don't have a rake or just show up at the beach, you can work with what you have. So if there are sticks or even rocks or shells, you can use that as a tool to create an interesting line. And using a stick, like you see here, it creates a thinner line, but um, a very sharp one. And that can look really nice for all sorts of effects. So just because you don't have a rake doesn't mean you can't create something. And in fact, using what you have around you can create a, a wide variety of really interesting effects. Um, also, if you don't have any tools whatsoever, you can always use your finger. Like that works perfectly well. It's a really great sand art tool. And, um, you know, most people have them. So. It's totally portable and you don't need anything else and and it's fun to just draw in the sand with your finger. It feels pretty cool too, um, especially if the sand is really um, thick, but uh, it will make your hands a little bit messy. So be careful for that. <laughs> uh, so the first technique that I want to share with you is a really great warm up exercise. This is what I do um, with my workshops to get people used to using the rake and getting a feel for how to move with the rake. And it's called the blob exercise because you start out by drawing a big blobby shape. It doesn't have to look like anything at all. In fact, the lumpier and the weirder the shape is, the better. And you just wanna start out with something that has lots of curves and lumps and bumps. And once you have that shape in place, you go around and you trace the outline of it. And so really that gets you moving and drawing different types of curves and following the line that you've created or following the, the blob shape that you've created. And you simply go around adding more and more outlines around the outside. And you can practice moving in different ways. So here in this example, I'm walking in front of my rake and pulling the rake behind me. So it's almost as though you know, the rake is tracing the footsteps that I'm taking. Uh, as a side note, if you are ever working on your sand art and you accidentally step on the line that you've raked like this, you see it kind of erases the line in that area. It's no big deal. You can just rake over your footstep and that, that uh, replaces the line. So here uh, I'm adding another layer to that blob shape, but this time I'm seeing what it's like to walk backwards and pull the rake toward me. There's no right or wrong way to move. It's just fun to experiment with different styles and see what feels comfortable for you and, and, and what effects that you get by moving in different ways. So using this technique, it's even though it's totally random and you start with a blob, you can cover a lot of ground very quickly and it looks really interesting, especially when you get to a point where you're adding 10 or 20 outlines. And there's lots of different variations that you can do to really customize um, your design and make it unique. So here I'm filling in every second layer. So you see there's, there's our original blobby shape in the middle, 
And then the next layer, I'm just going in with my rake and sort of coloring it in by raking it up. And it might not look like that much right now, but when you do have several layers, it makes it a lot more bold and dramatic and, and it really looks like something interesting from, from far away. So here you see with that same design, it looks completely different just by changing the one detail of filling it in. Another variation you can do is starting with uh, some other sort of shape instead of a blob. So maybe it's something more angular like a triangle or a star, or maybe you start off with a heart or a happy face. Different shapes will create different effects and also have you practicing the different types of lines. Another thing that I love to do with this exercise is instead of starting with a blob shape, use what you have around you. Maybe there's a big rock that's in your way or a big piece of driftwood. Use that as your starting shape and draw the rings and spirals around it. And um, very soon you'll have something that looks really interesting and unique. You can even try um, creating a bunch of blob sh shapes beside each other and create this network. It almost looks like ripples on the sand of these outlines um, rippling outward from, from your blob or your rock or your shape. So that's an exercise that I think is really great for, um, for beginners. Next, I wanna talk about making circles. Circles are a very versatile design element in sand art. Um, as you can imagine, they're the center point for any flower design or a sun design or mandalas, they're very important. They can also be used as a pattern element. So here is just an area that's been filled in with polka dots. You can also use circles to build larger shapes. So here is a little caterpillar um, design that is made by chaining circles together. This technique works best with a longer handle, um, something like a rake or a stick. And all you do is you stand where you want the center of your circle to be and you hold out your rake touching the ground and keep your arms in that same position as you slowly rotate around. So you're trying, you're trying your best to keep in the same spot and just turn your body around. And when you come back to the starting point, you have a really nice circle on the ground. So here I drew it with the handle end of my rake. And so now I'm going over it with the rake to make it more bold. If you're unsure about a design, you can kind of use the handle or the wrong end of the rake to sketch out your design ahead of time. So. It's a really quick way to create a good looking circle. If you want to play with the sizes of the circles that you're making, you just change the angle and hold um, your rake closer to your body. So here I'm, I'm in that same center point, but I'm holding the rake closer to me. So as I spin around, the circle that, um, that I make is smaller. But again, it's perfectly centered. It looks really nice and it's pretty easy to do. So that is another good, uh, a good, tip to have when you're getting started with sand art. Um, for the last technique, this is a very simple one that you can do without any equipment or any tools. Uh, and it's great if you are at a rocky beach or maybe you're at the beach when the tide is really high, there's not that much space to work with. If there are rocks around, um, you know, collect some. <laughs> maybe you want to go for ones that are a similar color or texture. And all you do is use your portable sand art tool, your finger, to draw a shape in the sand. And once you've done that, you can um, layer in the rocks and fill in the design using the stones or whatever else is around. You can use twigs or leaves. Um, if you draw something, you could even use different materials to color in different parts of your design. And it's also really fun to play with different colors of stones or different shapes, different sizes to create different effects. Maybe even you start out with gray stones and transition to white ones. Um, there's all sorts of neat effects that can be done. And the result is a really lovely piece of artwork that you don't need any equipment to make, but if someone were to walk by and notice it, um, it would look really special and really lovely. So there you, there you have it, a very simple uh, sand art technique or I suppose earth art technique, since it just works with whatever is available. So to recap, uh, the three beginning sand techniques that we looked at today was the, the blob exercise, where you go around and around tracing a, a big blobby shape. We looked at 
making circles using uh, a rake or a stick, something with a longer handle. And then finally using um, rocks or materials around you to embellish designs that you draw with your finger or your stick or whatever tool you are using. So hopefully you find that helpful and maybe it gives you some ideas the next time you're at the beach and want to get started with sand art. Um, I certainly enjoy playing with all these techniques and, um, and I hope you do too. Um, so we have a question from Raymond who wants to know, um, what, does this work in all types of different conditions? Because in the videos, it looks like the sand's really moist, almost like a clay or mud consistency. Mm -hmm. I think different places will have different consistencies of sand. Um, where I tend to draw it is like a little bit rockier. And I think that's why I gravitate to the rakes that are more like gardening tools because it kind of makes a deeper line. Um, certainly if you're in a location where the sand is a little bit drier and smoother, you, um, it would take a lot less effort <laughs> to make a really crisp line. So I think it just depends on, on where you are, what the conditions are like, and you don't really know until you get out there and start experimenting with it. And uh, Vanessa has a question about sand sculptures. Um, do you do any, or what are your experiences with sand sculptures? Um, I don't. That's not something that I have ventured into. Um, I think it's a completely amazing skill and definitely a different one. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to learn. That might be the next, uh, next hobby to check out on the list. And speaking of sculptures, I, that was also Janie's question. So it's a, sand sculptures seems to be a pretty attractive topic. Um, we look at scale. I know when you were saying when you first started in 2017, it's a lot smaller. So what are the effects do you find um, when you go bigger and bigger in your practice? Um, do we see that in your line work or even in the subjects that you're portraying? That's a great question. Um, I guess it depends on the design. Um, as, you, as you work larger, um, everything is, <laughs> how do I say this? Everything is to scale. So when I first started and was making smaller designs, um, a lot of the line work I would do just with the hand rake. But as I got larger, um, the hand rake wasn't wide enough. Like you couldn't see the lines as clearly as I, as I wanted them to be at that larger scale. So I think as you work larger, your tools tend to get larger. Um, and not necessarily the subject matter, but you just, you learn to pick um, and design uh, elements that have a lot of contrast to them. That's, that's the other thing that I forgot to, um, to mention is that when you're, when you're drawing with sand art, it's a little bit like anything that you rake is the ink and anything untouched is the paper. So you really only have two tones that you're working with. Um, and so you need to factor that in a little bit as you're creating your, your artwork. I hope that answered your question. So the tools change and a little bit of the design changes as you um, scale up and start making larger and larger pieces. And I know we have some new folks that are uh, joining us um, maybe just a little bit ago. Uh, we have some questions about, uh, do you photograph your art or how do you keep a record of everything that you've made? That's uh, the the short answer is I don't keep a record of everything that I've made. Um, I try to be pretty good and take pictures of most things. Um, other people who are walking by often take pictures. Um, but I think part of the practice of sand art is being okay, offering your artwork and in a way releasing it. Um, so I don't always document what I've made. Um, on my uh, Instagram and when I share my photos, those are photos that I've taken. So oftentimes once I finish a design, I will um, go back up to the beach and hop up on the pier and take a photo myself because sometimes from ground level, you don't even know what it actually looks like until you, until you go up top. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's great. So you can see the, the pier there with some people on it and the, the design. Yeah, so I will go up and take a, take a photo after I've done, um, after I've completed the design. 
So um, this is one of the ways that uh, people can get in touch with you if they made their own Pierre Doodle. Um, I would love to see that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if anyone here tries out any of the techniques that Larissa was mentioning uh, using this hashtag, Pierre Doodles, she'll be able to find you and your digital footprint and yes. maybe some of your sandy ones too. <laughs> yes. And I was wondering, you mentioned um, creating different Mandela's um, and can you show us a, a picture of uh, the Mandela for maybe some folks that uh, didn't get a chance to see it yet? Sure, like in the sketchbook here? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, let me find one. Here's one Mandela design. So it looks very intricate and, and very complicated when it's all done, but really you just start from the center and choose a little element like this little bump and just repeat it around the circle and then do the same thing with the leaf shape or whatever shape. And gradually over time, it builds into this really pretty design that looks very intricate, even though it's made of very simple shapes. So this is an example of a, of a mandala that I really enjoy drawing both on paper and uh, of course in the sand as well. And we have a comment from Janie saying that looks absolutely amazing. Does Thank the Mandela's um, take you normally longer than the one and two hours that you were kind of giving a time frame around? No, they're in that same, they're in that same time frame. Actually, it's, it's kind of funny. I find that the Mandela's are actually faster to do because well, they require <laughs> less yeah. measuring once you get going. Um, whereas something like, it's funny, something that looks really simple, like the frogs or the whales takes more time to um, get set up and uh and drawn out before filling in so the mandalas are very nice because you're just adding one element at a time it's very easy to um to even design them on on the fly or to improvise them and i know you were mentioning to us um another first for you recently was making sand art for a marriage proposal yeah that was amazing so can you tell us a little bit more about what has been your most touching or amazing moment um, you've experienced making public art? Would that be the one? Um, so that's a very difficult question to answer and just goes to show how, how awesome this experience has been. Um, I can't, it, it's, it's tough. I can't choose a favorite design or a favorite moment like, Every time that I go to draw, it's, I have no idea what to expect or, or what kind of story will, will come out of it that day. Um, one thing that this practice has shown me is that when you put your art out there and make it available to others, you, you leave it to be open to all sorts of interpretations that you, you never could have imagined from the get-go. So I've had it happen where I might go out and draw a flower because I feel like drawing a flower that day or that's how I feel like expressing myself. But someone else who is walking by might see that as a tribute to someone who they love who's passed away or a celebration of a milestone like a marriage or, or, or you know, a birthday party or a family event. Or to someone else it might have this symbolism that I don't consciously know about, I'm not consciously aware of it, but these amazing connections happen um, through the artwork. So it's, it's, it's hard for me to narrow it down. I think it's impossible for me to narrow it down to a single experience, but I've had so many amazing connections and um, experiences with others um, just through the artwork. It's absolutely incredible. I remember um, coming across a quote on your website um, and talking to you about what it means to have an offering for the neighborhood and putting out a piece of yourself uh, without waiting or expecting something in return. Yeah. I Vanessa has a question. Um, Hi, I have a question. Um, is it okay if you could follow me on Instagram? On Instagram? <laughs> mm. Can you send me a request? I, I really did. Okay, I don't have my phone on me right now, but I'll check it out. Okay. That's all I need to ask. 
Fantastic. And um, I was thinking if there's no more questions hovering right now, we could end off on that quote. Um, yeah, sounds good. Or uh, I would encourage everyone, you know, you never know whether you like something or whether it's fun until you give it a try. And whether that is sand art or some other hobby, I do really encourage you to just, you know, try something new without the expectations around it. Do something just for fun because you never know where it will lead. And also thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was gonna say. And also, and also thank you so much for being here today and for, for watching and asking all those awesome questions and participating um, because Again, even though this isn't sand art on the beach and, and we're all, you know, here virtually, this is another version of that or extension of that or way, a way of sharing that with everyone. So thank you so much for letting me share my story with you today and, and for being such an awesome group. So the quote I was mentioning that you can find on her website is, um, I believe in the power of art to delight just as strongly as I believe in the power of art to heal. And my hope is to do both for my neighborhood, my city, and beyond. Um, so I thought my last question of the day would be to Larissa, to what healing through art looks like, and maybe what the neighborhood looks like um, in your practice. So again, with sand art and really with any art form, it can be whatever you need it to be that, that day and within that experience. So as an example, sometimes I will go out to the beach and I have a very specific goal in mind, like I want to create something very fantastic or something very happy that will spread joy when people see it. You know, something that's light, like the frogs or something cartoony or something fun. And other times I will go to the beach, not necessarily because I know what, what effect I want to create, but I know what I need from it that day. There are some times where, you know, maybe there are things on my mind, there are things that I'm trying to work through. And really what's more important than the actual design is how I feel when I'm creating the art and how I'm expressing myself. So this one art form, this one um, method of creating a design can hold all of that at the same time. It can be a really fun and delightful thing. It can be something to celebrate, but it can also be a way to meditate or to heal or to work through things that are going on in your life. So I think that's what I tried to touch on in, in that quote. And, and that's something that I've really come to recognize through this practice, especially. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you again. Now it's goodbye for real. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. But uh, we, I absolutely loved having this time with you. And I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I am definitely excited to get out there on the beach with my yep. finger. And yep, shell. this is all you need. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever exists out there. And I really, really hope you guys will um, post pictures to Larissa or send them to us um, so we can see what you do out in the wild with her pearls of wisdom. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you again next time. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.